Beside him there's no other Give thanks to the Lord His love endures forever Give praise to the Lord Beside him there's no other This is the day This is the day the Lord has made We'll rejoice and be glad in Him. This is the day the Lord has made. Oh, I will rejoice and be glad in Him. He brought us from morning to dancing, from glory to glory. This is the day the Lord has made. So what are we waiting for? La 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 la. Come on and pray. restaurant which is a new cuisine for me and I was super excited but also I open up the menu and I'm looking at it, I don't know like half of the menu items and I was just like oh boy I actually felt like a little bit lost for a second but then our waitress came over and she was a rock star she broke down every dish she was telling us what other customers like 
she's given us some of her personal recommendations and what felt like kind of a unfamiliar experience all of a sudden just felt really welcoming and we had a fantastic meal. And that's how we want you to feel at King of Kings. It can be intimidating to come to a new church for the first time, but we want you to feel like you're a part of our family because that's really how we feel. So please, if you're a first time guest or if you haven't connected with us before, text that number that's up on the screens right now. We wanna send you a gift and some information about our church to welcome you in. There's also our next steps room right across the hall. Lots of people in that room who would love to help you learn more about our church and get connected here at King of Kings. Now there are a lot of things that I am excited about in 2024, but one of the biggest is the way that we are going to, at this church, really lean into prayer. And if you wanna get a jump start on that, join us for Reliance Night on Wednesday, uh, November 29th at 6.30. It is gonna be a night of praise, it's gonna be a night of worship, and it's gonna be a night of leaning into our value of Reliance. Dave and Johnny have some really fun and impactful stuff cooked up for that night. So please join us, we'd love to see you there. Now, I do not have the privilege of having any kids yet, but I was a kid once, and I can only imagine how difficult I was at times, especially during the busiest and most stressful time for travel and shopping of the year, especially when I'm all hopped up on sugar from hot cocoa and uh, peppermint sticks, and especially as I'm giving my mom minute by minute updates on my Christmas list. Uh, bottom line, if there's ever a time of year where parents need a break, it's Christmas, and we want to give that to you. So please join us for Parents Morning Out. This is gonna be Saturday, December 2nd. This place is going to be filled with inflatables and snacks and different activities that'll help kids burn off their energy while parents get a two and a half hour break. You can use this time to do whatever you want. You can Christmas shop, you can get coffee, you can take a nap. I had a mom come up to me last year and say, I hadn't had brunch for eight years until this morning. Thank you. And that's what this is all about. Even if it's as simple as going and getting brunch. Actually, I shouldn't say it. Brunch is extremely important. Go get brunch. But we just want to provide a way for the community to come and rest and have some time. So action steps. Parents, get your kids signed up if you want to participate in this. Everybody else, invite your friends, invite your family, invite your neighbors. Like I said, this is a way to invite the community in and just show them that we don't want anything from them. We just want to love on them. And if you want to help make this just a super impactful morning, both for parents and kids alike, we have plenty of volunteer opportunities. Just go to the next steps room or check them out online. And most importantly, this event is free. People get just get a couple hours off without their kids and their kids get to come have a good time. They don't pay a cent for it. And that's because of you guys. That's because of your generosity and your uh, your tithing and we are so so grateful for that I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people who have started attending here not because they came on a Sunday but because they came on a parents morning out or because they came to the back to school event something like that it's super meaningful and there's no more meaningful time to talk about tithing than in November because this is when we ask you to make commitments and those commitments help us to understand what our budget is going to look like for the coming year so we can plan for events like this and just other amazing things to make an impact on the community. To learn more about that impact, we've got a quick video right now. Hey church, we're here today to share with you about Pledge Month right here at King of Kings. I personally want to invite you to pray about making your pledge to King of Kings this year, especially if you call this your church home. It's vital for you to help us shape the framework of ministry here at King of Kings in 2024. Your pledges, that helps us know the commitment we can make to global missions, local ministries, kids, students, community programs. Your pledge matters. It helps us plan for ways to impact our local school partnerships at places like Standing Bear, Disney, and Concordia, and pledges equip us to come together as a family to support our second campus, King of Kings Northwest. Hey, as the campus director of King of Kings Northwest, I am thankful for your support. More than 100 new families have experienced transformation through reliant, authentic, courageous, and generous discipleship led by you. You make that happen. From day one at our Northwest campus, there have been people growing in relationship with Jesus. 
some for the very first time. Each Sunday, more than 200 people from the Northwest community share the love of Jesus and hear the gospel. So it's time for you to commit to how God is leading you in 2024 here at King of Kings financially. God doesn't do this to get something from you. Rather, God is doing something for you. You're an answered prayer. And while God doesn't need your money, your neighbor needs the opportunity to know Jesus. So today, pray about where you are on our generosity ladder. What intentional regular gift will you make? Are you committed to tithing 10%? Will you sacrificially give saying no to something else so that your yes financially can help someone experience a yes from God? So join us today by making a pledge either on our, our new awesome app or even on our website. Your pledge, here's what it does. It makes heaven fuller, the kingdom stronger, and our lives greater. And thank you for being the church on earth that seeks to bring God's kingdom here in Omaha and beyond. Amen. Let's continue in worship this morning. Let's stand.
in his mercy, trusting in his grace. But we stand as sinners. Those who have not obeyed or followed the will or the ways of God. And God calls on us to recognize our sinfulness. And not only recognize it, but actually confess it. And so I want you right now to take a moment with me and to privately confess the sins that you have done before God. Where you've hurt someone else, yourself, relationships. Where you've decided to say, God, hold on, I'm God and you're not for a minute while I do what I want to do. So let's confess to our God privately. God, though, doesn't leave us to say, just privately say what you've done. But he actually calls on us to acknowledge that we are sinners. There's this beautiful piece in the liturgy that says, we confess the things that we have done and those things that we have left undone. And so I want to invite you to join me right now to publicly confess that we acknowledge we are sinners. And together to say, I am sorry, Lord. So let us do that now. I am sorry, Lord. We are sinners. But God doesn't leave us in our sin. He doesn't turn from us in wrath. Instead, he welcomes us with open arms. And he desires to turn us from those who are dead into those who are alive by connecting us with Jesus and his resurrection. And that's the beauty of this communion moment. So let us come before God, acknowledging that we can talk to him at any time and in any way and bring anything spiritually and physically to him and he'll answer it in the best way. Let's do that by praying the prayer our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to take your communion elements. It was in the night in which our Lord is betrayed. He took the bread, gave thanks, and he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. I invite you now to take and eat the very body of Christ given for the forgiveness of all our sins. In the same way also after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is a new covenant of my blood, which is given for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. I invite you to take and drink the true blood of Christ given for the forgiveness of all our sins. And now, may the body and blood of our risen, living, and coming, Lord, Savior, and friend, Jesus the Christ, strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith from now until life everlasting. Depart in his eternal peace. Let us proclaim the good news that Jesus lives within us as the crucified Lord who's given us life over death. my sin was dead and you knew I couldn't pay the debt and you paid it with your final breath oh hallelujah hallelujah and you took the wrath that I deserved broke every curse your mercy had the final word oh hallelujah hallelujah we see Christ and Christ crucified and you were raised from death to Christ
our beautiful risen Savior who took the cross. We are so humbled by the blood you shed and the power of your promise in our life. God, we thank you for the blessing and love and joy that you give us every day. Thank you for this place to raise our praise. And thank you for your presence in our life. In your name we pray. Amen. Please have a seat. church. It's a privilege to be with you guys in worship today. We are in the middle of the Christmas season. Now hang with me for a second. It even makes me sick to my stomach to say those words out loud. We've seen a movement in our culture where we start celebrating Christmas earlier and earlier. I was reading an article this weekend. It's talking about how retailers around the country are now moving up Christmas sales to coincide with back to school, right? Makes sense, right? Get your spiral notebook and your highlighter with your presents and your Christmas lights. It's just a more efficient thing, right? And I've seen around this city, and it breaks my heart, to see heathens who already have their Christmas lights on. <laughs> now, I take it by faith, no one in this room is doing that, but I'm talking about outside these walls where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, right? And we all know that after Thanksgiving is the correct time to turn your Christmas lights on because that's when Jesus turned his Christmas lights on. Amen? <laughs> we moved here from Texas 10 years ago, and we had to learn there's a little different culture up here, something also different called winter. We didn't have winter in Texas, uh, but we missed our lights our first Christmas here because it froze before we could actually get up on the roof and put the things up. You see, in Texas, some Christmases you celebrate with 85-degree temperatures. I know, shorts, football games, air conditioners going on, but other ones, the temperatures would dip into the frigid 50s at times, guys. It was crazy. Fireplace going just to stay warm and stay alive. <laughs> but I remember one Christmas when I was about eight years old, and neighbors had Christmas lights up. And I remember analyzing these, and they were different back in the day. Uh, they were large bulbs about this big. And for whatever reason, my eight-year-old mind decided to experiment with those. And so I went across the street and started unscrewing these glass Christmas bulbs. I walked out in the street. I started to throw them in the air as high as I could. And to my excitement, there was a beautiful explosion when they hit the ground. Well, I did this and did this, and then went home not thinking of anything. And when I walked in my door, uh, I was greeted by my parents who were not very happy with me. And they told me that I had to go apologize to my neighbor in person. And that day I had a friend's birthday party and they said, you cannot go to that birthday party until you walk across the street and apologize for what you've done. And I can still picture the walk of shame across the street, tears coming down my face, and the door opening, and me just trying to weepily apologize for my delinquency that day. And for those of you that look at my parents' discipline, you would say, well, yeah, that's, that's healthy. The parents were disciplining you in that moment. Otherwise, you'd probably be in prison by now or something much worse. Who knows? <laughs> but their discipline and their correction was based on love, relationship, and trust. And they knew better than I did at eight years old my pathway in life and the values of our household. And I tell you that because we're continuing our journey in Revelation today. And we see Jesus approach the seven churches of Asia that day with correction. 
And it's not just correction for correction's sake. It's coming from a place of love. And Pastor Greg started the book of Revelation last week. I'm excited for this series. Revelation, the word comes from the Greek, how we would say in English, is apocalypsis, where we get the word apocalypse. But I believe our culture has infiltrated the book of Revelation. I did a quick search this week for apocalypse movies, and the category that came up was doomsday movies. And so when we think of Revelation or apocalypse, we think there's been nuclear fallout and zombies are walking all over the place. And that's what we impose on this book. But as Pastor Greg said, it, it means an unveiling, a revealing of the truth specifically about Jesus. And so we see in Revelation 1 verse 4, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to open them with me. We see the purpose of this letter and who it's written to. It says John, that's the Apostle John. He was exiled to the island of Patmos. This is about 96 AD. And look who he's writing this to, to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before the throne. So he's writing this letter specifically to seven churches. And there were more churches in the area at that point, and these seven churches were likely the first recipients of the letter of Revelation. And they would have read that, and they would have passed that on to other churches in the area. And as Pastor Greg shared last week, these churches were facing immense persecution from the Roman authorities. They were being killed, they were being scattered. And so the main purpose of this letter to them and to us is to bring hope and courage in the face of persecution and suffering. And what he's doing in these letters is he's pointing these churches to look forward and have hope and courage when Jesus returns and we're in the new heaven and the new earth. And so these seven letters, they were written to specific first century churches, but they apply to all churches for all time. So there were literally seven churches that they're going to reference in letters, but it applies to all believers and to you and to me today. So it was written for us, but it wasn't written to us. There's a difference there. And Pastor Greg said this last week, and hopefully we hear it most weeks, it can't mean to us what it didn't mean to them. And you'll see we impose our culture on this text, and we have to step back and see the context of first century Asian churches. And here's a map of those seven cities I think like a lot of Americans, we would see this and not know where that is in the world. That's modern day Turkey. And if you go to the west of these seven churches, you'll see Eastern Europe and Greece specifically. To the south of it is the Mediterranean Sea. And then if you go southeast and around that landmass, that's where Jerusalem was. So Christians were persecuted and spread all around the known world. And these seven cities are very prominent, important cities. Some were very Uh, important trade routes, and some were port cities. They they were very wealthy, they were very cosmopolitan, had a a varying set of beliefs, and the church was affected by them. So again, they're, they're real churches, but it also applies to us today. It wasn't written to us, but it's for us. As Pastor Greg alluded to last week, numbers in Revelation are symbolic. So seven is the number of God, the number of completeness. So he's writing to all churches of all times. And if you'll notice in the letters, there's context referencing their specific culture, their ways of life, their buildings, wars that they got affected by. And so if if God was writing a letter to us, he might reference things in Omaha and say, uh, your brutal winners here might be talking about that. Or your roads and the potholes and how they dissolve like sugar or something like that. Or he may call out a specific worship of false gods of unnamed pumpkin patches or football teams or whatever it might be. So people in Omaha would say, oh, I get that, pumpkin patches and roads and cold winters. And so that's how they're writing to these churches then. But the danger, like I said, is when we take our modern bias and our modern situation and we impose that on the book of Revelation. And I hear it time and time again. It's usually when something's going wrong politically, which seems to be always, and we'll say whichever political candidate we don't like is the Antichrist. I've heard that before. Or during COVID, we would say the COVID vaccine is the mark of the beast, and it's just not true. So let me let you breathe a little bit with that one. Because it didn't mean that to them, so it can't mean that to us. And we'll see there are seven letters. We'll look, look at one in just a little bit. But Jesus has a very distinct pattern that almost every letter has. 
And so he begins with different names or descriptions of himself as the authority. So we see the authority of Jesus. In almost all the letters, there's some encouragement, except the one today. Uh, We'll see correction in almost all the letters. There's a call to repent, to listen, to turn, to hear what Jesus is saying. And then he ends with an eternal reward. We're looking forward to the new heaven and the new earth when Jesus returns. If you have your Bibles, go to Revelation 3, verse 14. And we want to dig into the letter of the church at Laodicea. Laodicea was a prominent trade route. It was very wealthy. They were prideful. They were self-sufficient. It was the banking hub of the region and one of the most wealthy cities in that whole area. They were known for having textiles there. That was their big thing. They were actually black sheep, so they would have black clothing. We'll see that later on in the letter. They were also known for having a prominent medical school where people would travel all around the known world to come there to study and learn the best medicine practices of the day. And we'll see also they had an eye salve. They would put drops in your eye to help with whatever infirmities you might see. And lastly, it was the center of imperial emperor worship. So there were were temples all around where they would worship the Roman gods, specifically the emperor that was in power. So here we go, verse 14. To the angel or the messenger or the pastor, there are different interpretations of the church in Laodicea, write, these are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Merry Christmas, Laodicea. Ouch. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. There it is. Love and correction are together. They're not exclusive. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on the throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So we're going to see that pattern unfold in a letter and dig into each one of those areas. And first, Jesus reveals his own authority over the churches then and the churches for all time. So first, Jesus presents himself with seven distinct and unique titles of authority which represents total authority over the church. So again, it's written to these seven, but it's written for all believers for all time. So his words are true for each one of us today. In a different letter, he says that he is the one with the sharp and double-edged sword coming out of his mouth. It's speaking the word of God, the truths of God, the judgment of God over his people then and now. I think there's been a shift in our culture, especially as it relates to faith and religion, and we don't like other people having authority over us. We've had a movement in our culture to where I am my own authority. I dictate my own truth, determine what's right and wrong. No one's going to tell me what to do. And the problem is it just conflicts with the Christian faith. I was having a conversation with someone a few weeks ago, And they've been de-churched for a number of years. And they were talking about possibly going back into church. And just, I was listening to them. And they said, hey, there there are like three things we really want with a church. And they were uh, different moral issues that are very relevant today. And it, it wasn't time for debate or theology and digging into scripture. But I stepped away from that conversation. I thought those are very important, complex issues. But it's the wrong starting point. The right starting point is who is God. And if there is a God, What is his truth? So those are the step back questions that this person was not taking into consideration. And I believe this is where Jesus is starting each one of these letters with a statement of authority, not an authoritarian, unkind authority, but he's saying that I am the authority. I have authority over the churches then and the churches now. And so I want you to think in your own life, who is a great leader that you've followed, who's a great coach you've had, who's a great teacher or a mentor or something, and what qualities about that person make them great? 
And I've had the same boss for a number of years, and she's incredible. She's, she's smart. She's kind. She's compassionate. She's a great leader. Smart, funny, compassionate. Yeah. Her handwriting is hard to read sometimes, but... <laughs> But she's incredible. She has a great job of approaching me and leading me with grace and with truth. There's love and there's trusted relationship and there's correction and standards. And even the last couple months, there have been a couple times we have our one-on-one meeting and she's brought correction into my life. And hey, when you were in these meetings, I noticed this and you said that and that caused this to happen. And I was like, yeah, you're totally right. I apologize and I'll change my behavior. So I think when there's good leadership, We love to follow that. We actually crave good leadership. And all those human leaders you thought of, teachers and coaches and bosses and whatever it might be, Jesus is so much greater as a leader than they are. He's not an authorian top-down bark orders at you. There's compassion. There's love that's blended with this discipline. And so we see in John 1, it says that Jesus came full of grace and truth, that love and that correction. And this leader went so far that he gave his life for us. John 15 says, Greater love has no one than this, that he who lay down his life for his friends. So he speaks from compassion, from love, wanting his people individually and collectively then and now to follow him and come underneath his authority. And just as you saw my parents correct this little delinquent back in line, right? That's what Jesus is doing with the churches then and with the churches now. So let's move to that correction. So Jesus, he corrects the church in Laodicea for being apathetic and ineffective. This is what he's correcting them for. And I think this section of scripture is one of the most misinterpreted passages in the Bible. Verse 15, let me read it again. I know your deeds, and that's important. He's evaluating their actions that they've already done. I know your deeds, that you were neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So... Because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. And what I've heard this interpreted as, and I've heard it even recently in the last couple weeks a few times, is it's a measure of faith. That we want hot followers of Jesus. You're, You're burning with passion. You have passion to follow Jesus. But then think of that faith spectrum, and it doesn't make sense. It kind of breaks down. So then you would say lukewarm is kind of somewhere in the middle and like maybe identify as a Christian but not living it out fully and then go even farther and say cold would be the absence of faith that you would be an atheist. So I've always wondered why would Jesus say I want you to be burning on fire passionate or I want you completely cold atheist. That doesn't make sense, okay? He's saying lukewarm. You're like, that. I, I don't get it. Great. So it's not a spectrum of faith but it's the effectiveness of your deeds. And when you begin to study the city of Laodicea, it makes more sense. The city had so much going for it, but the one major deficit they had was a bad water supply. They had a river through the city that would flow very slowly and then would eventually dry up almost every year and they wouldn't have water. And so as the Romans did then, they would build aqueducts from all around and source water in. So they didn't have it in Laodicea, but two of the cities around them, they did. To the north was Hierapolis, about 11 miles away. And up on these cliffs, which you still see today, there's hot springs that bubble over and have rich, chemically charged hot water. And they had medicinal purposes for the people of that day. But as that water travels 11 miles, it cools down, it becomes lukewarm, and actually the chemicals concentrate and they make you sick if you drink it. So he would spit that out. To the south, Colossae was an area where we see the book of Colossians come, to, come from. But there they had a great water supply. And it was similar to Hierapolis, but different temperature. It was this mountain spring that would bring fresh, cooling, refreshing water four to five miles into the city of Laodicea. But once it arrived there, it would become lukewarm and it was not good to drink that water. So this is what Jesus is saying. It's not a measure of faith specifically, but he's saying, I know your deeds. I evaluate what you're doing, and you're just apathetic and ineffective. You're not benefiting anyone by the way you're living out your faith. And he's calling them to hear and to respond to his voice in this moment. There was a survey that Pastor Zach alluded to a few weeks ago. Barna did a survey uh, in, in the churches of Omaha 
And what are you Omaha people, Omahans, Omahites, Omahonians? What are we? I'm just kidding, Omahans. So there was this survey that was done, and one of the stats they tried to measure was who identified as a Christian in the city. And 67%, or four out of six, said, yes, I identify as a Christian, okay? Then they further broke that category down, and they said only one out of six is actually a practicing Christian. Three out of six are non-practicing Christians, which is an oxymoron in my mind, okay? But the bar to being a practicing Christian is so low, we trip over it. So they measured it and said, this is a practicing Christian definition. If you identify as a Christian, if you say faith is important to me, and if you attend church one time in the last month, that makes you a practicing Christian. Think of that in a different context. What if you said, uh, I'm a non-practicing spouse in a marriage context, right? (laughs) It doesn't make sense. Unfortunately, there are a bunch out there, but it doesn't make sense. I've been to a number of weddings. I've heard a lot of vows that always have similar wording in it. Love you till death do us part, honor you, cherish you, whatever. What I've never heard at a wedding is someone say, "I I promise to be apathetic, unkind, uncaring, self-centered, right? I have never heard that at a wedding. Because if you were at that wedding, you would stand up and say, what's the point? What are we doing here if you're not going to serve this person? So when we look at this non-practicing Christian, it doesn't make sense. And that's exactly what Jesus is calling out the church of Laodicea and maybe the church of King of Kings today. I don't know. Because there's no such thing as a non-practicing Christian. I've read scripture cover to cover a number of times, and I've never seen it. It's quite the opposite. Followers of Jesus always make an impact. We say we are transformed inside, and then we are sent to transform lives. In Matthew 5, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And salt was used. They didn't have refrigeration, so it would prevent decay and death in ways. And light was to illuminate your path and show you the ways of life that only Jesus has. So it's not this measure of faith, hot, lukewarm, and cold. It's your effectiveness by being changed by Jesus. More on this church. We see the Laodicean church was centered on self-sufficiency, and they were consumed by the Roman way of life. So there were temples all over the area, and it really influenced and affected their faith in a negative way. Verse 17 It says, you say, I am rich. I've acquired wealth, do not need a thing. They have a different perspective. They're looking very worldly at how they live out their lives. But you don't realize you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich. And white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness. And salve to put on your eyes so you can see. So again, this is a very wealthy affluent, self-sufficient area. They're proud of themselves and who they were, what they'd accomplished. And back in 60 AD, there was a major earthquake in this city that destroyed a large chunk of it. And the Laodiceans actually refused government intervention because they were so wealthy and so self-sufficient. And so they worshiped at temples. They had gods in that era where religion was almost flipped where it was all about me, and then I would just go to whatever God I wanted for whatever I needed. So they would have different temples where you would worship there and offer sacrifices, and they would have like a goddess of beauty, which I'm praying for myself right now. Uh, They would have that. They would go to them if they wanted beauty. They would have a god of war. If you're going into battle, you would go worship there and offer sacrifices. And there were a lot of sexual rituals involved in this cult too. If you wanted success in business, you would go to this god over here. And it affected and diluted their Christian faith. And I wonder in some ways if there's correlation between that culture and our culture today. Where affluence and comfortability are the ultimate gods. Where Satan just puts these things before us and says, hey, try a little more of this. Hey, go get your significance from that. Your identity is in the world here and all your traits and abilities and stuff like that. And Jesus is calling for response from the church then and the church now. You see, the church of Laodicea, they fooled themselves because they were self-sufficient, they had no need, and that's not the way you approach the Christian faith. It's quite the opposite, where you come fully in need, fully in surrender, 
fully in authentic, authenticity. So the text, it says, you say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. So Jesus points out that there's a human kingdom, the visual kingdom that we see, and there's a spiritual kingdom of his realm that's so much more. And he actually points out three cultural aspects they would have known really well. It was, it was a trade route, a major trade route of that day, a finance hub, lots of banking. And so gold was a commodity they would exchange goods with. So they had literal gold, but he's saying, I, I have something better for you. I have gold that's refined in fire. All the impurities are taken out because of my kingdom. I said they were big into textiles. They literally had black sheep and they would wear clothing of black wool and they were very proud of it. And Jesus knew that, and he would say, I have white clothes for you, a mark of holiness, a mark of purity, a mark of sanctification. And then lastly, I've said, they had an eye salve, they would have healing properties back there they were known for. And Jesus says, I I have the salve that will actually open your eyes to see my kingdom, because they were missing everything that was before them. And then in verse 19, there's this call a call to repentance. And I love this line. It just stuck, stuck with me every time I was preparing this. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. There it is. Love and correction are not, not mutually exclusive. They go together. So be earnest and repent. Repent is kind of a, a churchy word, but it comes from the Greek word metanoeo. And it actually means where we like get the word metamorphosis, where a caterpillar changes into a butterfly. There's an internal transformation that has fruit that's external. Does that make sense? So he's saying, repent, turn from these ways, admit your brokenness and sin, admit how you've been consumed by the world around you. I love the quote from American theologian and pastor R.C. Sproul. He says it this way, for a Christian to be a Christian, he must first be a sinner. Being a sinner is a prerequisite for being a church member. The Christian church is one of the few organizations in the world that requires a public acknowledgement, like Pastor Greg did, of sin as a condition for membership. There's an honesty. It's not me at the center and go use the gods in whatever way I want. It's quite the opposite. It's me surrendering to the authority, the truths of Jesus, admitting my brokenness, my need for him, that Jesus' blood was sufficient that paid for all my sins, past, present, and future. Now I have new relationship with him. There's transformation there. So there's love and there's discipline. And that there, uh, it's a Greek word, talks about training individuals, children specifically, correcting them with restraint is how they would say it. I watched this movie recently, and I won't name it because I don't know if I recommend it or not, uh, but it's poking fun at the shift in discipline in our culture today, how we've become a very child-centric culture that they kind of run the show. And so the scene takes place. We go to a birthday party for a five- or six-year-old, and the kid comes running over, and he's crying, and he says, ah, Billy hit me in the head with a stick, right? So there are two dads hanging out, talking, and then the dad of the stick-hitting kid, Billy, runs over there, he grabs Billy, picks him up, takes the stick, throws it away, and says, we're going to come apologize. Well, right then, mom intervenes and stops dad, gets Billy on the ground, and says, Billy, it's okay. Whatever you're feeling right now is okay. Just let your feelings out, buddy. And he screams. And she says, do you want to apologize? And he said, no. And then the mom says, go get him his stick back. And I'm like, this is terrible parenting, Right? This is what we're seeing, maybe. There's a shift in culture where it's very kid-centered. And unfortunately, working in student ministry a number of years, I've seen these kids with no discipline grow up. They become monsters who turn their Christmas lights on before Thanksgiving, right? (laughs) But you see, this repentance is always a callback. This discipline that Jesus brings to us is healthy. There's love. There's truth. Balance there. Because we think we know what's best for us, and we don't. We're kidding ourselves. That's why the word of God matters so much. And Jesus says in John 10, I've come, you may have life and life to the full. And if we're honest, we've all tried ways that we think will bring full life to us, and they failed. There's no life outside of a relationship with Jesus. And so he's pleading with the churches then and the churches now, hear, respond. If you have an ear, hear what the Spirit of God says. Turn, receive my discipline in love. I think 
if we're honest with ourselves, we've experienced loss in relationship. And you can think of a, a spouse or a friend or kid, parent-kid relationship. If there's unwillingness to hear in a relationship, it can lead to a severing of the relationship. Years ago, my wife and I, uh, some of the closest friends we've ever had, we had some challenges. And there were a few things that they did that, that hurt us. And so we weren't sure how to go and what the next step was in this process, but we just thought, man, we've got to reach out. We're so close, we've got to reach out and just share how they've hurt us and work through this with reconciliation. So we sent an email, kind of listed out, hey, we love you guys. There were a couple of things you guys did. We'd love to talk and just work through this more. And so the response email w- was not a posture of humility. It was not a posture of hearing. It was defensiveness. It was blaming us for things. And so we kept trying to reconcile this relationship and reach out through text and email and try to call, and it, they didn't respond well. And so we had one last effort where we said, hey, we're going to be in town next week. We would love to meet you guys for lunch. And they said, no, we don't want to meet with you guys. And so that severed that relationship. Thankfully, now we've actually reconciled, and they've owned stuff, and we've talked and apologized and all that kind of stuff. But if there's an unwillingness to hear admit mistakes, have humility, it can sever the relationship. And what Jesus is saying is don't sever the relationship. The spirit of God dwells within you. That's how I speak to you and you receive faith. Don't get a hard heart and be unable to respond to the grace of God. So he's pleading out of love for these people to respond. Now, as I was working through this and praying, I was just like, is there a specific word the Lord has for King of Kings? Like, I know your deeds and your coffee is great and your events are great, but I hold this against you. And there wasn't something like that. I think we can make things too flashy or big or visible. I just don't think that's where God always works. But I think the truth he has for us today is this. Be faithful to the word of God. Be led by the spirit of God. And be shaped by the community of God. The Christian faith is not complex. When he's saying, overcome, overcome, it's just continuing on in faith. And so we see the word of God, that's that's your authority, that's your truth. The spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us as Romans 8. And it's not this complex thing, staying in step with the spirit is what Galatians 5 says. My guess is no one applauded you for taking steps into church today, right? But that's how faith life is lived out. Small steps, consistent steps, persevering. And we're never meant to do it alone. That's why God wired us to be in community like this. We've become increasingly more isolated and it's just detrimental to our well-being. And so if you're living in isolation, that's where Satan thrives. That's why we've seen such an increase in mental mental health issues and things like that and depression. So he's calling you to step into community. And I would say, which of those three or all those three are speaking to you today? the value of the word of God in your life, being led by the spirit of God and being engaged in the community of God. And then as we wrap this letter, it's fascinating because the church in Laodicea in some ways gets the strongest rebuke, but also gets the greatest, most loving promise any of the churches get. Verse 20, as we wrap up, it says, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, there's a response. I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame, persevered, and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It's a well-known verse. And I've seen different pictures and paintings that illustrate this picture of Jesus standing at the door and, and knocking and I chose one, it's a, it's a lithograph from the 19th century, and it, it actually was done in 1883, which is the same date the University of Texas at Austin was founded. So I was like, the Lord's hand is all over this, I don't know. <laughs> That's where I went to school. Um, so a couple things I want to point out in this picture. If you look to the right of the image on the door, you notice ivy that's growing up. And I think that's, that's sin and that's worldly ways. And if it gets out of hand, it's going to cover up the door. There's going to shut down and sever that relationship. And Jesus is coming and he's knocking on the heart. And again, the, the, the door represents individuals and the whole church. We make it so individual. But it's like the church that he's speaking to here. And the other feature that I notice in this lithograph is there's no handle on the outside. 
It's always our response. Jesus is never gonna force his way into your life. But I, believe, I believe he's knocking individually and collectively as the body of King of Kings today. He's speaking, he's calling to humility, to hear, to respond. And I love the promise that he says, I'll come in and dine with you and you with me. And back in that culture, dinner as it is now is like a symbol of relationship, deep friendship, deep family. This is the longing Jesus has is to restore this relationship. And he's pointing forward to the heavenly banquet that is to come. And the words here to him who overcomes, it sounds like a a doing word or doing situation but we get a clue later on in Revelation 12, verse 11. It says they overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of his testimony. And so what we see there is word and spirit. The word of God reveals why Jesus died because we sinned and went separate from God, made our own way, and we were eternally separated from God. That he came in the form of a human and gave his life for you and for me. That that relationship might be restored. That door might be open. We might repent and return to our relationship with Jesus. And then the word of the testimony, that that's you, that's me, that's celebrating what God has done in our lives. We talk about we transform lives, but we're first transformed by the grace of God. And then we're sent out. And I love this. As you see, as we continue next week in chapters 4 and 5, which is the culmination, the crux of the book of Revelation. When we open the door to Jesus, the door to eternity is open to us. So watch this as John continues in 4.1. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door, a second door, standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. That someone is Jesus. And so we respond because the spirit of God is knocking on our hearts today. We receive what God has for us and then the doors to eternity now and forever, the new heaven, new earth are open to us. So I invite you to stand As we close today, let me pray for us. God's knocking. Let's respond, King of Kings. So Jesus, I'm thankful for your word. Your word made flesh in the person that you came full of grace and truth, that you lived the perfect life that we couldn't. You died a horrific death and you rose from the grave. We might have life now and life eternal. And Lord, I pray even now that you're knocking on our hearts. You're calling us to hear. You're calling us to respond. You're calling us to repent and step into the fullness of life that you'd offered. And Jesus, may we be transformed, that we may transform a dying world. Lord, send us out with hope, with truth, with love, and with grace. We love you. Praise in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.
Amen. Can we celebrate the goodness of God today? Can we celebrate what he's doing? So I believe God is knocking on our hearts. And for some of us, it's a call to repent and get under his authority in the word and be led by the spirit, be in community, use the gifts that God's given to us. I believe there's a specific call today who the, those in the room may not identify as a Christian right now. I wanna give you a step in a few minutes to recognize your own brokenness, your own sin, your own need, that Jesus is your Lord and your savior. And if he's knocking today, and that's you for the first time who say, yes, I wanna take that step of faith and become a Christian, just go ahead and shoot your hand up right now. It's good, church. Can we celebrate what God's doing in the house today? That's so good. Amen. Now may we leave and depart as the church that's sent out with passion to reach those who don't know Jesus yet. Amen. Love you guys.